Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Unbottleneck, the podcast where we solve common digital marketing problems and we have a very special treat today. We have Scott, I get it right this time, Stoffer, <laughs> spelled Stoffer, pronounced yeah. Stoffer. Uh, <laughs> Scott is, uh, is actually this genius that I've been looking forward to talking to since we started the podcast. We actually were in Napa and where I think we're on like episode three or four or something. I'm like, oh my God, I got to have Scott on the show. And it took me a year to do it. So I'm super excited. Scott's the CTO and co-founder of Market Brew, who we also are um, stakeholders in, in helping to uh, help our clients get much more data from uh, from what's going on in the web analytics to support the search strategy. So Scott uh, graduated from the prestigious Carnegie Institute of Technology at Carnegie Mellon University, where he earned a BS and an MS in computer and electrical engineering. He spent the last 20 years building out large scale, highly distributed and scalable software systems. We'll translate all that in a minute um, in both corporate and small startup environments. He also acts as the company's chief evangelist, speaking to thousands of people each year at various events. In addition to experience at IBM, that's what he and I both have in common. I was at IBM Global um, and other large organizations. He's helped raise millions of capital in early to mid stage tech startups. And as a co-founder, he's been instrumental in rapid prototyping and product market fits. We'll talk more about that in a sec. He's an inventor and an author of multiple utility patents in the software and search space. There go Market Brew. And he's also an accomplished musician, instrument, pilot, and skydiver. Wow. Scott, how do you how did you do all that? You look like you're like 23 years old. How is it you've done all of this stuff in such a short window of time? All right. Well, you're really setting me up here. Um, uh, thanks for having me on. Of course. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've always just been uh, somebody who's very goal oriented in life. So uh, I think anybody who, who's goal oriented like that, um, like me, can share in the understanding of like, you know, you just you're uh, one of the weaknesses. I would all start with my weaknesses is that I get bored of things. Right. So yeah. like I you, 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 it's like a game, a video game. So you, you accomplish the, you know, you get to the end of Mike Tyson's punch out and there's no point in playing it again, the game anymore because it's, you've already solved it. And so you just move on to the next thing. Top so I'm constantly timer. moving on yeah, from one thing to the next. Um, so I don't, I don't really get too stuck in one area of, of uh, anything. Um, I'm sort of a, um, a generalist type of a person where, uh, I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not ever going to get a PhD in anything. Uh, but I, I definitely will dive as deep as I need to, uh, from an engineer's perspective to solve whatever problem I need to. And so I learn a lot of, a lot of things about a lot of different things. That's I amazing. generally don't, uh, spend a lot of time, uh, doing, uh, like reading uh, fiction or doing a lot of video games or stuff like that. Most of my oh, time you're, is spent you're a productivity in, hacker. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I, most of my time spent just researching and uh, getting lost on, on, uh, you know, technical manuals and sure. uh, tutorials and stuff like that. And so that's just sort of, you, you know, when that, when that happens, you start to become like a, a nootropics junkie and you're always finding like the <laughs> ultimate thing that you could do to, to maximize what your capabilities are as a human and human potential. And if you go yeah. down that road, there's no turning back. You're always going to be wanting to, to, you know, better yourself, your, your body and your mind and the whole thing. Um, so musician, that's super cool. What do you play? Uh, well, I've always been in the music. Um, and people always say like, you know, there's some connection between like math and engineering and music and stuff like that. I really believe that, um, uh, just the type of mind, I guess. Um, but I, I was started out playing piano when I was uh, around six years old yeah. and got into playing uh, trumpet when I was, I think, 10 right. um, and then uh, got heavily involved in, in uh, playing uh, in various jazz bands and a, a professional marching band uh, called the Blue Coats, which is a, a professional uh, drum and bugle corps that we toured around the world. Um, uh, and so Tour did that for a little world. while. That's and incredible. I did, uh, uh, I was in a rock band for four years in, uh, San Francisco. <laughs> so if you're in uh, San Francisco in the early two thousands, you might've saw us. Um, Dude, that's like a goodwill hunting story. Like you're out there and someone's <laughs> like, like, what do you know? You're just a musician. You're like, well, I actually went to Carnegie Mellon and <laughs> you are an idiot. <laughs> like I said, so I just, I, I get, I get bored of things. So I, I, I'm, I've done a lot of things. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, I just, I've always been into, into music. I've, I've dabbled with it. Uh, I, I do a lot of, uh, I have a, uh, a, a flying, uh, YouTube flying, uh, channel called 210 driver, uh, okay. where I, 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 uh, show off our, uh, our 
or company plane that we purchased. No and way. so we go flying around all the different areas. And, um, and so I do a lot of the music behind that. So I'll, I'll, uh, do a lot of the, the well, editing next and premiere time you're and cruising like down that, to really Ensenada or Cabo, make sure you stop in LA and, you know, pick me up. Pick you up. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's sure. All right. Awesome. <laughs> it's a deal. So that the, the moral of the story is that there may be a correlation in, um, in brain function by getting into music and learning music. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that one on my, my 2023, like, um, wish list of things I want to do. My, my list is like overflowing for this year, but next year I'm definitely going to music. I always want to learn how to play guitar. Um, well, let's, let's dive in. I know, I know everyone's like, you've got a search engineer. Why the hell are you talking about music? <laughs> <laughs> Could you, in your opinion, not like the industry or, or the way the, the world perceives it, but in your opinion, can you take us through a, a kind of a quick overview of, of how search engines work, particularly search engines like Google? Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this is obviously a long conversation that we could have. Uh, if you want to just sort of the, the TLDR, uh, you, you're really going to just uh, go through the history of search engines very quickly. We started off with sort of content-based search where you just had content. We index that content. Uh, index means that we sort it in, in a logical way to retrieve it very quickly. And crawl, crawl uh, the next it, render, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. The Alta Vista days. Yep. Uh, so Alta Vista was a, a very popular search engine before uh, Google came along. And then Google uh, came along, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, and uh, developed a, a, a algorithm called the PageRank algorithm uh, with one of their right. first uh, search engines. Uh, and what that did was essentially take the citation structure around that content and inject that as sort of a signal uh, to, to sort of increase the signal to noise ratio and understand a little bit more about like which pages are the most important to a search engine. Uh, and so as we go through time, uh, we move from more of like a rules based search engine where programmers like me are, are writing uh, finite, you know, static rules, uh, the sets of rules that, you know, sort of try to filter out good and bad, uh, or, you know, mostly bad spammy sites from their search engine, trying to improve the search engine results right. and, and uh, move penalties. more towards a, a machine learning uh, environment where we we start with the end result. We say, okay, what are the sites that we want to have in our search engine result page? And then uh, put that into neural net and basically out comes all the sort of bias and weight settings on all those algorithms that we had previously you know, wrote. Uh, now we attach these little dynamic variable weight, weight settings because we as programmers really don't know what the weight setting should be. Uh, we let the neural net sort of figure that out. So that's basically right. what sort of the the... The modern search engine is today where uh, we have humans kind of uh, feed the the end result into the search engine and then the the neural net and all the machine learning uh, data scientists will take that and uh, allow the the search engine results uh, to look very similar to that by just sort of uh, doing the, the the what it what a neural net does best to sort of fine tuning all the different uh, neurons or whatever the, uh, the <laughs> configuration uh, for that search engine is. Yep, it's it's funny. I hear I hear that um, if you asked an engineer why a certain result was ranking, uh, they most of the time wouldn't be able to tell you because it's like, well, it's whatever the the AI decides to display. You know, like we we gave it some clues as to some things that we think would be important, and um, and then it'll display it, and then it it you know learns from there based on how users interact with them. Um, you know, with those results. So. You can't uh, if you can't you can't bribe somebody at Google to tell you how to rank your page because and in, in today's environment it's it's nearly impossible to to give a fixed list a prioritized list of, of what things to um to optimize for so which is great yeah, because that makes it less easy to manipulate right correct yeah that's the whole point is is uh, making it a little bit more generic um, you know we as SEO you know SEO practitioners we understand like the basic constituents of of what goes into the search engine algorithms. In fact, you know the the, the search engine modeling tools that we've developed at Market Brew do a good idea. Uh, how, it's a good explanation of that. Or sort of have a generic list of of all the type of algorithms that we know go into the search engine. But again, uh, we don't know what the individual weightings are. We kind of use a, a machine learning process, much like Google does, to sort of reverse engineer sort of understanding which which algorithms are more important in certain uh, search engine result pages so yeah. yeah you can't really go to a search engineer and, and get the full the whole playbook um and that's sort of a you know that's really changed our industry over, over the past five years i'd say sure has you, you mentioned the term neural network and 
Um, what exactly is that? And why did Google go from a, like a rules based to a machine learning based engine in the first place? Was it simply to reduce manipulation or was it um, for some other purpose? Yeah, I think you touched on it before, right? So their primary driver uh, these days is, is uh, or the primary driver of revenue these days is, is, uh, is the paid side, right? So they're, they're selling ads, uh, anything they, they can do to push people towards the, the, the paid side, um, they're going to do. Uh, so that means uh, up to and not, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, including, you know, j removing uh, data that you used to have, you know, the not provided, not provided. was sort of the first wave. Uh, and, and ever since then, it's just been a slow etching away of, of you know, transparency into their search engine. And this is just, a, it's not that they came up with neural nets and machine learning to solve this type of problem. It just fits so nicely into their grand uh, vision of you know trying to push more people to to buy more ads and also stop a lot of the the black hat that stuff that was going on and, and you know in the early 2000s and and you know, a little bit later on it just you know it's a it's sort of a barrier to entry it's a moat that they're developing around their their algorithms that mm. uh, gives them some leeway to uh to, to you know if you're not able to to pinpoint exactly one loophole or one specific algorithm it's le it, you're less likely to have uh, uh, breaches in your in your search results where you have just you know somebody come in and try to take over all, all the all the keywords off of just one little loophole that you have in the system. So it's a little bit easier to uh, to protect against something like that. And also also buys a lot of the uh, leeway for for um, some of the PR that they do. You know the interactivity with the SEO community, the the engineers or the the VPs at, at Google. Um, you know, can kind of just sort of wave their hand and say, you know, it should look kind of like this, you know, but they don't have to really kind of give away any secrets uh, right. at the same time. So they can appear that they're actually helping the, the, the community at the same time. Um, they're also, you know, helping their bottom line and pushing people more towards uh, paid. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's actually that's, really that's controversial if you think about it. If the organic results suck, you're going to click on the paid ads and they want you to click the paid ads because they get paid for every click. That's interesting. It's a... I know I mean, it only goes, it only goes so far until you know, a, a, a competitor comes along with a, a more functional and, and a better set of search results, but uh, they've built up such a moat that it's sort of, it, it sort of works that way. Uh, Scott, these didn't, days. That, didn't that happen with Ask? Like I remember Ask Jeeves back in the day was like the best search engine ever. And then one day I woke up and all I could see was ads. And then the next day Jeeves yeah. was gone. And the next yeah. day I just stopped using Ask. <laughs> Yeah, there, it's it's the Achilles heel of of any search engine. Obviously, you really that's what that's why Google is the, where they are today is is their prowess with with organic results, right? So they develop the best organic results of, of any search engine, um, and you know at some point they may lose sight of that. If some some argue that they've already lost sight of that, um, but at some point it, the tipping scales will there will be an entry point. Uh, or a, a door to walk through an opening uh, for for a competitor like uh, you know any of the the small the, the any of the, the competitors that are out there right now. Obviously, you can uh, come up with maybe two or three that that Duck have DuckDuckGo and whatever. Yeah. DuckDuckGo. There's a I think there's another one uh, recently, but um, yeah, bet? it's, it's uh, the door is widening. I would say at this point, the you know it's accelerating uh, in that in that respect. So. So we'll yeah. see, Google. It could happen to you if you're uh, if you're listening to this. So pay attention. Yeah, not anytime soon. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did have a question about, about algorithms, but it was it was pretty broad, and I want to dig in a little bit deeper to it. And sure. In terms of if someone were to come to you, Scott, and say, could you could you in a couple sentences explain um, Google's algorithm today? Like not the you know the historical uh, page ranks and the toolbars and that kind of stuff, but but today, what are what are some things that I need to pay attention to as an SEO at a, at a kind of a high level um, by understanding some basic information about the search algorithm? Um, so obviously, you know, I'm going to have a hard time uh, talking about basic building blocks because I could sit here forever because there are millions of basic building blocks. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you that the sort of the secret today mm -hmm. uh, with SEO is not not so much uh, you know, obviously you have to have an entry level of understanding of SEO, right? There's, okay. there's basic uh, concepts, popularity and search behavior signals. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh -huh. and, and all of that kind of just fits into those, those umbrellas. And the, the, the key really today uh, is understanding the priority of all of those actions. 
There's so many combinatorial ways that you can approach uh, SEOing a site uh, that I think most people who aren't uh, understand understanding like the inside of a search engine don't uh, actually understand all the the possible pathways they think well i just do them all right like i'm just gonna do them all well, the problem with that is is that a lot of times when you're optimizing one area it actually detracts from other areas so it's yeah. not a i think it's not speed, a, but now my user experience sucks correct <laughs> so it, it's all connected and so it's really a matter of um not getting yourself caught in in the old like whack-a-mole game or you want to be able to know exactly what is going to move the needle for your site in a particular search engine result page. And for that, you, you really have to have some sort of testing tool to, to be able to understand in that SERP, what, what, what are the priorities for this? What is the search engine priorities? Because they've adjusted, you know, almost per, per keyword, uh, what algorithms are sort of the ones that are uh, really important and which ones they don't really care so much about, even though, yeah. you know, that mix might be completely different in a different keyword. So that's really the key today. I think is it's not so much about um, you know it's it's many different algorithms and the, in each each uh, environment is sort of like a different mix. That's sort of the magic behind uh, the neural nets is that you can can apply this uh, different set of bias and weight settings uh, <laughs> almost infinitely. Right? It can be different. I love, I love in almost Mar every market Brew's new tagline, Scott, is, is Market Brew. It depends. It depends, right? <laughs> I love it. I'm sure we get a lot of love from the uh, industry for that, but yeah, yep. that that's a great one. I, I'll have to take that down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question: Is there anything in the uh, in the claim that search engines like Google purposefully exclude um, certain uh, you know certain voices? Are search engines you know are are uh, are they developed with bias in mind? You hear a lot about this with like fake news and. The, the um, bubble, yeah, like yeah. we're talking about the Google, uh, was it the Google bubble or? Uh, or... Yeah, so I mean, there's there's clearly, um, you know, as much as Google wants to say otherwise, in fact, actually, they admitted so much, I think in, I think in 2011 or 2012 at Google I.O., I think uh, Larry actually got up and answered a question from an audience member, and you can go back and look at the tape, but basically this audience member asked him, you know, aren't you worried about... Uh, pushing people towards your worldview, uh, you know, and, and giving them, you know, like a, a sort of your own biased uh, view of search results and, and, you know, understanding of the world. And uh, Larry's response was, well, we, we believe we know what, what's best. <laughs> and wow. it was kind of so jarring when he said that, like all of us, we were just like, Oh, <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't expect him to actually say something like that. I thought it was more going to be more, you know, didn't a little more self-introspective, just that? hey, you know, yeah, that's a possible <laughs> problem, and that we were working to solve that, that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, there, there's obviously, and I won't get into the obviously the politics of everything because we could go totally into that at this point. But um, I think the, the 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 answer to your question is is yes, it it, it definitely is biased. Um, I think the the common misperception, especially with GPT-3 and GPT-4 and, and so on and so forth, is that these uh, these neural nets that you can, you know, ask a question and it just spits out the answer like it's a human. Yeah. Uh, people tend to forget that uh, that is all based off of something that's already been written, already been uh, published on on the internet somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 not like the it's not like they're sort of deriving like a, a, a a PhD would would take in a bunch of different texts and 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 come up with a new theory uh, based off of you know some uh, deducing something. Uh, it's it, it's uh, all dependent on what they're feeding into the model. And in this case, it can be manipulated. For Google, That's the worst. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it certainly could, and 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 it it sort of is right. Like if you think about uh, you know Google's uh, uh, script where they get you know a hundred page uh, book on like this is what's good and what's bad, right? To its yeah. Uh, quality search rating guidelines. 167 right? pages last time. I 167 is up to you, right? So, so essentially, what that is is the label handbook, right? So when you look at a neural net, for those of you who aren't are familiar with what a neural net is uh, or machine learning, in machine learning, you you have uh, you you basically are labeling data, and in this case, in the context of search, you, they're they're basically labeling the search engine result pages. They're they're saying this these are good search results, these are bad search results. You know these are sites that look spammy, or these are sites I wouldn't give my credit card to. Those kinds of things. And so you give it enough data, and then the machine learning can actually say, okay, well I'm going to run it across a billion other sites, and I'm going to pick out all the other sites that look very similar to that, whether it's good or bad. 
And that way, in a way, it's, it's a highly scalable process, right? We can just say, here's, you know, tell us humans, please tell us, you know, what we should end up with, something what, that it should end up with. And then we can kind of go back and, and uh, articulate what the different settings and bias and weight settings are for each individual set of the search engine model or uh, the, the algorithms inside of, of the, your search engine so, really so that is, we can arrive to something very similar to that. We're basically approximating that, taking a finite set of rules and we're approximating something that's it's already been defined on the other end by that's those quality search, search rating so guidelines. Different. You're right. That's why the search is so different for every every query that you run. In some queries, you're going to get a lot of video and news and social and other queries. Yeah, and so just the, blue links and black text. Yeah, and then you have your, your money and your life, your money or your life. And uh, you know we've talked about. And in fact, Mark Abru just uh, 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 is releasing a, a, an expertise factor algorithm, which defines, which is a way to define that, right? So we we have a specific way to look at um, and we do entity detection and disambiguation like any modern search engine does and we get basically the understanding of what the, the uh, piece of content is um, well, and, knowledge graph that's and, awesome. yeah so and so once we have that information we can understand you know any given page on the on the internet uh, what the level of expertise is right so what what the what, what what the content is on that page and what it would look like if that person was an expert right? We know the body of, of topics. We know the cluster of topics that are surrounding those those topics that, that they're talking about on that page. And if you were an expert, you would then uh, expect that expert to, to touch on all these uh, various uh, areas right. versus somebody who's more of a narrow focus right. on their right. content. And so that expertise factor, uh, we, you know, we throw that into, into the model as an algorithm. And how important or less important, we don't know. We, we use this thing called particle storm optimization. It's a artificial intelligence uh, approach to sort of like this genetic algorithm that allows us to sort of reverse engineer it. We can kind of point it to any search engine uh, result page and outcomes sort of like all the bias and weight settings on our model that that approximate what those results look like. Um, very similar sort of to what they're doing with machine learning and Google, but it's sort of a different approach to it. Um, same result where we can then say, okay, well, in these search results, uh, expertise is very important, or in these search results, expertise isn't as important. And so what you'll find in, in the your money or your life uh, sectors is that that expertise score has a lot more importance in our models, right? So you can actually see this in, in the models where th those those areas, those SERPs uh, will contain a, a higher weighting or bias and weightings uh, for those types of algorithms. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it really depends on the, the, uh, the sector, the industry sector, um, there's so many different uh, there's so many different factors, right? We could we could go in all day about like what d differentiates or or uh, makes one industry different than the other. But the the idea behind this is that Google tries to write this 167 page document so that their raters can just go and look and and give them that feedback, and then it all kind of just gets scrubbed in into the model that way. So I love it. Yeah, so, there's a lot of a lot of con conspiracy about whether those are ranking signals that they're they're using in the guide. And you, you've hit on something really important because it really, it really isn't. It's a, it's a third party. It's not even Google in the raters group. It's like a third party that's doing these, these ratings. And all they're doing is rating whether a search result, like you said, is uh, spammy or helpful or useful or, or dangerous. And um, yeah, I do, not... I do think that the, the content guidelines could can be uh, biased though, right? So yeah. like if you ask a question, if if your if your guideline says, you know. Uh, we believe uh, sites that do this are uh, not as trustworthy. Um, right. So uh, any right. sites that look like this, you know, uh, you know, mark mark a certain way. So it's almost like you know, in a in a courtroom, like a, a, a lawyer leading on the witness, right? Like it's sort of the same concept where it depends on who. And, and you can you know, you can you could argue as a search engineer, you could argue today that the person who comes up with these guidelines, this this quality rater guideline, is are the, the, some of the most powerful people in the world because they're in effect adjusting the worldview of everybody that that uses you know the number one search engine in the world. So That's true. Um, it, it it definitely uh, does does stand to reason. There's quite a quite a bit of bias um, this, just this, just by definition. The question does come up a lot. Where um, so if Google's crawling my website, they're going to look for a trust signal or an expertise signal. And my understanding is that it's it's not that smart yet, right? It can't just say, oh, here's here's a name that I recognize. Like and and 
there was this thing called author rank for a while for a very right. short window yep. that that did play a little bit of a role and allowed you to have your your thumbnail of your picture next to your result but um but i i believe that raider guide like you said is is a separate document to help influence the change in search but doesn't doesn't mean that Google is going to crawl your site and look for those signals, right? I think it has to do with just um, the types of, of sites that appear for certain queries and yeah. trying to provide better answers when people are performing those queries. And you're right, it's it, it's very, it, it can be manipulated it's, uh, so much to the point, I know I have a, a client that's in the Rolex industry, I think we've talked about him before, and um, He's, he's a consignment site and he's going after all these upper funnel keywords that are really helpful pages of great content. One of them is how to find your Rolex serial number. And the, the feature and answer that came up wasn't his. And he was like, what's going on? So so we took um, we took six or seven words from that featured answer, put it in quotes and did a search. And we found some, I don't know, like 20,000 spammy websites that were uh, using that text uh, as a way to sort of force Google to think that their answer was the best, even though the page, you know, didn't really have any good links to it. It was just like this mass syndication, like in the old days of black hat yeah. SEO, you know, the SE, SE nuke days and traffic geyser days or whatever. Right. And, um, hopefully those tools are gone by now, but, uh, but it was, it was disheartening because, you know, our goal as a business is to create great content to, to share it, get other people to share it if they find it helpful. And then when competitors, you know, go to China and Russia and they pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to spam the hell out of the search results or to spam the hell out of the, the, the web with their short answer, you know, with an H2 or an H1 right above it with, the, you know, how to, where to, why to that they want to appear for. Um, it feels it feels like a losing game, you know, and I know Google's trying to get better with with detecting spam. They do that, I think, pretty well with links. But I don't think they're doing it yet with context, and um, I know it's kind of off topic, pop topic. But uh, could you talk to that a little bit? I mean, these are all things that keep up a search engineer at night, right? I mean, honestly, I so you know we've we've built our search engine to be sort of like a model of Google, right? That has yeah. all the different you know components that we've sort of uh, a lot of it was grandfathered in when when things were really easy to understand, so we knew which algorithms to to incrementally add to our model. Right. Um, but so we've got this whole host of, of all these algorithms in market brew that, uh, you know, it, 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 as a search engineer, I fully understand the challenge that is constantly tasked with, uh, their team. Right. So, uh, no matter what you do, uh, there's always going to be something that you could to, you could use to, to abuse the system. Right. And it really just a matter, it's just a matter of understanding how the search engine works and then using that against the search engine. Um, I think machine learning obviously has gotten us uh, way further down the road as far as getting rid of all those loopholes I could talk to you about before. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the question of, of are there loopholes and are there things that uh, Google needs to, to close? Absolutely. Uh, is machine learning, is this neural net approach uh, infallible? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's just a, um, it's going to be a, a progression and you'll always have this sort of issue with this. I think the, 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 uh, the worry I have for Google specifically is that as they become less transparent in their, in their goal to sort of push everybody into paid and, and, uh, try to get as, as far uh, of a reach away from, of, uh, their organic, uh, underpinnings, uh, with the SEO industry. Yeah. Uh, you, once you lose touch with the industry that itself can help feedback and help you with your search engine, uh, you run the risk of it just being, you know, taken up, taken over by the only people that really want to stay in the game, which is the black hat people, the ones that stand, a you know, these fly by night, uh, operations where they can just take a stab at it for a couple months and, and take another stab at it. And, then and it's really just, a, it's not a real business, there. right? It's not a brick and mortar way of viewing the world. That's so. Cool. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, back in the day, I think like 10 years ago when we were doing market brew in the early stages, uh, one of our taglines was like, you know, we're, we're actually help because everybody, you know, we'd talk to Google people and they'd be worried about what we're doing. Cause are you reverse engineering Google? Are you like, you know, what are you our adversary here? Or, sure. and so one of the things that we always came back to them with is we're actually showing people how, what a search engine wants to look at what, how a search engine wants to view the world, right. uh, what, what's good for a search engine. 
And so in, in effect, what we're trying to do is, is sort of fight against this grain that they're, they're trying to take data away and we're trying to give data to the SEO industry, right? We're doing the opposite. We're trying to, to make it more transparent. They're trying to make it less transparent. I don't think that we're in odds with them specifically. I, I think we're both trying to help Google, uh, but it, from, you know, just like we go back to the paid side of things, it's just, it's really clouded their vision, right? They, they, they really have lost track of the, the need to stay in touch and make sure that that feedback loop exists within the SEO community. So the controls are definitely going away. I can feel it. I can feel it in how they're handling paid with a lot of the bidding automation and, you know, hey, don't even worry about keywords anymore. Just put your URL in there. We'll crawl your website. We'll figure it out. Keywords we'll, don't exist. You know, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, we're it's entities. Been, and it's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, I remember there was a day where we would bid on every fermentation of a keyword, singulars, plurals, misspells, you know, um, <laughs> yep. everything you could you can imagine to make sure that we had the full girth of, you know, um, visibility that we can have when we did paid. The good the yeah. good thing is they're still giving us that data in the paid side. So we can we can learn from that. And it's a it's an expensive learning, but if if you do some paid search for a while, um, and even some display uh, you know, in, in Google Ads, you get some data that you can pull back into your SEO strategy for um, you know, for example, the the search term data. What search terms actually produce sales or leads for you? You know, and are those words incorporated into the copy on your website somewhere? Are they, do they have a dedicated page assigned to them that you could, you know, then you know point your ads and your ad group to? Um, the placement reports you could look at those as as native advertising opportunities, and um, you know, just reach out to those sites and say, hey, we're getting some really good traffic from your site through a Google ad. Um, we'd love to do something a little bit more formal with you with advertising. And then you go back a few minutes, a few months later, and you say, hey we've been doing really great with the advertising we've been doing with you. Um, you know, we'd, we'd also love to do something more on the organic side. We just did this study of this research. We'd love to give it to you. Just give us, you know, credit for it. Um, and they're, they're going to want to say yes, because they're gonna, not going to want you to stop advertising with them. So there's some ways that you could do, you know, you can, you can augment your organic strategy with the data that you get from paid. How long we'll get that data? I don't know. And you definitely don't want to use your remarketing data from placements to, um, you know, to, to optimize your organic, but, but the demographic information can be helpful because as you understand, you know, who, who's actually clicking on ads, that's becoming a customer, you can rework the language on your site. Like you mentioned, using tools like market brew to, um, to use the right words and the right um, uh, topics that are important to those users that are driving customers. So yeah, I think there, I, there always needs to be that marriage between paid and organic, you know, <laughs> absolutely agree. And I, 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 one of the things that, uh, we're able to see in market brew with the search engine models that, that we have uh, is the ability to understand how relevant keywords are still right. So like, I know there's a lot of proponents out there. I know uh, some of you uh, by name who are watching this probably now and they're, they're going, don't say it, but uh, keywords that we have, we, we actually have a, a keyword model uh, understanding of, of content. And, we, and then we also have a, a, a semantic entity uh, topic modeling uh, what you think of today as is sort of like the, the way that Google looks at content. Ooh, we could do uh, a whole podcast just on that. We totally right. could. Uh, so we have what I think it's called, it's called, uh, we call it uh, market focus. That's our keyword based uh, algorithm. Yeah. And then our spotlight focus, which is the sort of the, uh, the semantic entity uh, uh, um, way of view of the world. And both of those get uh, uh, put in each model. And both of those go through the same particle storm optimization. They get calibrated the same way. So we can see in every single search engine result page which ones uh, are more important than the others. And uh, believe it or not, the keyword algorithm is still very, very strong across many different uh, uh, keywords uh, and industry sectors. Uh, so, uh, you know, as, as much as people want to believe that, that keywords don't exist anymore uh, <laughs> or, you know, it's all about semantic entities and entity modeling, yeah. uh, it's, it, it's a little bit of both still. I, I think it, it's... Um, I, as a search engineer, you'll you'll never throw away a signal, right? You might just say, "Hey, here here's the signal." If it's down, you know, we've got meta description in our model, right? It's still there. Uh, it it's very low. The signal is very low on almost every single search result uh, placement, um, but it's there because you know, one, you know, you can target other search engines other than Google and in Market Brew, so you can. You can make your own search engine if you want to. You can feed it your own search engine and calibrate it to that. If you're, um, if you're a mom and, or a grandma and you're using Bing, Scott's talking. You can you. go right ahead and calibrate it to Bing. <laughs> and so, 
the and then two obviously uh the the the, the fact that there is any signal uh non-zero signal uh there's no incentive for a search engineer uh to to throw that away so there's a lot of signals that are still in google that people think are long gone uh they're still there a lot of them don't don't count as much as most people would would believe but it doesn't mean that they don't count at all um uh, but holding keywords in the first sentence but, or but as far as like keyword based algorithms uh those okay. those still perform very very strongly in a lot of our uh, a lot of our models alongside the new topic modeling and, and semantic tools uh, that also are starting to come online uh, very strong as well. So, love it. Uh, yeah. So it's hey, a little worst, bit of both. The worst that could happen is is uh, you you add some new keywords and topics to your page, and suddenly you start appearing for more keywords. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the worst that could happen. <laughs> um, I love it. I know we're we're um, we got so many questions I want to go through. I'm going to skip around a little bit and go to the ones that I think are are going to be the most helpful for sure. our listeners. Sure. Um, let's do 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 do. do. Uh, can search rankings be predicted and how? Uh, can they be predicted in, in a, in, so, so search, so, so yes, the, the short answer is yes, but I'll, I'll explain it. So w when we talk about prediction, we talk about understanding what uh, a given model would output uh, at T equals zero, right? Time equals zero today, right now, this instant. Okay. Um, and, and that itself is actually a prediction, right? Because, uh, what what you see on Google search results is often uh, not at t equals zero. It's it's usually t plus uh, you know insert your number. Uh, it can go as far as like sixty days or even longer. If it depends on you know the the, the age of sites and stuff like that, or in different in industries. Uh, I think people get very confused a lot because uh, you know a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of my friends that work at like you know some of these big e commerce companies. Uh, in their, on their SEO teams, they, you know, they say, well, uh, you know, I, Scott, I, I, I can publish something today and it'll show up in the search results, like literally in the same day. Like I'll see okay. this, the, I'll see the, the update in the search results. Um, and so what they're looking at right there is, is the, uh, the results of the caffeine update back in, I don't know, 2012, 2009. 2013, I think they introduced caffeine. If you can believe that. That's all 2009. Yeah. I, I lose track of time. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, but People so, so. That caffeine update, what that did is it, it sort of uh, uh, separated, uh, de uh, desynchronized the, uh, or made it a asynchronous, essentially, the, the, the updating of the search results and their scoring process, right? So uh, before, uh, what happened is you had to wait till this sort of serialized process of scoring, go running through all these different algorithms. Why is it serialized? Well, it's because that a lot of algorithms... Uh, the inputs to these algorithms depend on outputs of these other algorithms, right? So you can't just run them all in parallel yeah. on different servers. Uh, so, so a lot of them have to be Google running. Yep. Yeah. And so, yeah, exactly. You're, yeah, that's the definition of why Google Dance exists. So you, you, you had this process where you had to wait uh, a, a, a specific amount of time. Uh, you know, it, it, it could be, you know, as quick as uh, a few weeks or as long as a few months uh, back in the day we had the supplemental index it could be a, a six to 12 months um if you were in that index uh so you would have to wait till the scoring process was over today what what happens is they've selected sort of uh they've sort of said okay part of this is ui right so our search results part of it is like a U user interface type of of uh update and the other parts are really just kind of like you know the it, the other part is the ranking and, and the ordering of everything. And so a lot of times what people see is the UI part, the caffeine refresh, where you're you're basically uh, making a change to the meta title or description, or it doesn't really matter what it is. They basically will, will pull in that new data into their search results, into the index, and uh, they'll do that very quickly. Uh, and so that part of it uh, and that, has and no a test, right? That's not a, a, you deserve to be here. It's a, Hey, we we think you might be a good result based on this change. We'll test you based off that. the previous scoring that they've already yeah. run, right? The pr yeah. previous round of scoring, and so and so what ends up go to the second page and you're like, what happened? I was number one. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what and you'll see this question pop up all the time uh, on on various forums. People say, you know, I, I I published this. I was great for 30 days, and all of a sudden I just fell off the map. You know what happened? I when I published the data, we went up like five ranking positions. You know. Okay. And then, and then what happened? So what, what they're seeing here is this sort of the, the two different processes. They're seeing the UI refresh of the SERP 
and then Google finishes running their their changes through all of these serialized process, this scoring process that, that they take every single piece of content and link through, and out comes the the new sort of new ordering of of results, and that then they'll see that, and their rank trackers will pick that up in in another thirty days or whatever. And so basically, what what when you ask the question, can search results be predicted? Um, it is possible. Um, the the the, and the I, I'm trying not to be also very promotive of, of Market Brew, but that's essentially the the process of of developing a search engine model, calibrating that model to whatever search engine that you're trying to 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 uh, emulate. Uh, once you have a calibrated model, you can get to t equals zero very quickly because you don't have to crawl the whole internet. You don't have to score the whole internet. So in Market Brew, we can simply just have a, a what we call analysis groups, and and it's just a sort of a a uh, little universe of of pages uh, uh, and and links, and so you know it's our, our it's a sort of like a mini Google, and so we're able to very very quickly run that uh, through the model. Any changes that you might uh, do, or any competitor changes that might be happening, we can run that through there very quickly, and so we can get to t equals zero very quickly. We're not t equals zero, but we're much closer to t equals zero than you know, any other possible, uh, scraping and, and much uh, better than just guessing. relies on Google search <laughs> results. Yeah. yeah. I love it M much better than just guessing. And, and those prediction models are important because businesses need to start forecasting, you know, what the, their potential is. We have a restaurant brand that really is focused on off premises right now during the pandemic with delivery and takeout car side curbside. And, you know, we're, we're constantly testing and trying ways to, you know, to move pages up and move content up, uh, get pages, more visibility. Um, had we not created a, a very ambitious forecast of where the opportunity was, um, they probably never would have approved the initiative. They didn't know, right. you know, what their, their potential was. So this, this prediction, uh, model, boy, if I, if I could have ran it through, <laughs> it would have been incredibly, uh, incredibly different view for them and, and probably would have meant, you know, incremental, um, work, you know, for, um, for all teams to, to start, you know, hacking away at, you know, and yeah, the I think of it, time, oh, go ahead. I uh, just think think of it as like as unit testing, right? So like from an engineer's world, you're you're you want to be able to, you want to boil it down to unit testing. Do you be able to, you want to be able to to introduce any small change to a site and just test that one change. You don't want to have to batch it in with a hundred different changes. Yep. So uh, if you can create a tool that can unit test or have a a, a, a way to very quickly test small changes. That's really what your goal is, and, and that gets you to what, what you were just describing. I love it. I got two more questions for you, and we'll wrap it up. The first sure. one is about Google's black box. You've mentioned that before. What what exactly did, does that mean, or what do you what do you interpret it as? I mean, it just it's just a euphemism for uh, sort of the the opaqueness of of okay. Google. Um, I, I, we you know for, from a marketing perspective at our company. The way that we position us, ourselves is obviously, you know, if you're using another tool, likely the, the data is coming from outside the black box, right? So they're, you're scraping the data off of Google search results. So you're not really looking inside of, of the search engine at all. You're just basically looking at the final results, right? The final uh, nodes or exit points out of that, out of that large box. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that Google black box is sort of the, 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 the thing that continues to grow as, as all this data is being pulled away. So that's, that's all it is. It's just gotcha. a sort of euphemism. No worries. All right. I think everyone me included want to know what's going on with market brew right now. There's, there's so much last time I was in the system looking around at, at ways that I could optimize content and, um, and you know, different, different topics of things that I could create uh, and tests that I could run. Uh, what's new, what's happening at market brew? Uh, so we're rolling out basically Market Brew 2.0 um, okay. across the board. There's a ton of stuff. Um, the 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 thing that we're rolling out actually on uh, let's see what today uh, We've been we're talking doing this for Saturday a months so now, so it's really gonna happen. We're recording. Now. Yeah, we're recording this, and uh, it's uh, January 24th. Uh, <laughs> the end of this week, uh, we're actually doing a soft release, uh, which we'll be doing a little bit more publicly uh, a couple weeks from now. But we're releasing a brand new UI. So basically, the whole thing is getting refreshed. It's getting sort of like the the nicest looking UI that any tool has out there today. Um, we're very proud of it. Uh, it's it, we've gone, you know, thousands of hours of work has gone into this from the team. Um, 
just uh, not not just uh, refreshing the UI, but also understanding uh, what the challenges are from a workflow perspective, mm -hmm. what users want to see, uh, the, eliminating as many clicks as possible. Um, it basically just a lot of feedback from our clients and, and uh, internally from our team, just on what uh, you know as a as an SEO uh, in house SEO or as an SEO agency, mm -hmm. what do you want to see? How do you want the the tool to perform? So all of that's going to be rolling out, uh, and and uh, so we're very excited about that. We've added a bunch of stuff lately. Um, let's see, I have a, I have a list here. I remember, I had a little. You're going to ask this question. We <laughs> yeah. So so we so the last quarter, what well, we we just introduced um, Market Brew Spotlight. So Spotlight okay. basically is our uh, our knowledge graph inside of the model. Right. And so it basically does a couple of things. It, it does named entity extraction, uh, entity detection. Uh, name resolution um, and entity disambiguation. So uh, it does a lot of things where you can, you know, feed it a, a piece of content uh, and it'll extract out the entities in the content and it will actually link those entities directly to the Wikidata corpus. So Wikidata is a structured uh, data corpus that's built upon Wiki Wikipedia. Uh, so essentially we are tapping in and building our own knowledge graph as we build these models. Uh, and so you as a, a content producer uh, can see a spotlight score, essentially, uh, based off of whatever search that you're doing on our model. So just like a regular search engine, you're typing in a keyword and it's going to do a search on uh, the, the spotlight uh, algorithm that we've developed. So it's basically uh, taking all this entity uh, disambiguation mm -hmm. and it combines it with, with uh, uh, link citation structure around it. So we, it's basically using our, our sort of like the leading edge uh, uh, link graph uh, in, in uh, our software, which we've been known for for, you know, 15 years, uh, the link flow distribution graph. And that basically gets tied into the, the spotlight focus. And you get this sort of basket of phrases or basket of spotlight entities that the search engine that, uh, now knows this, this page is about. And that gets scored against whatever keywords that you query against, just like a, if it was HTML, right? You're scoring that, that HTML, you will, you'll score this basket of phrases. Um, and so all of that is now available in the, in the product where you can actually, uh, uh, and you can even, uh, we have a thing called Spotlight Author, which allows you to, to then on the spot, just change the content and see if that, that scores better. Uh, so you can essentially just, uh, as a content producer, it's sort of a dream because you can you can start writing, uh, put it into the model, and then instantly see what the gap is between your content and the outperformer in the model. And then the model gives you the knowledge graph. So you can literally just go in and say, oh, well, I'm missing. It, it'll tell you the coverage. It'll say, you know, you're, you're covered, you know, 40% you know, coverage on this topic. And you can go and click in all the topics and subtopics and just pull out the abstracts and start writing about the content that you're missing. Build your content uh, and, marketing calendar. I love it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's literally just a, it's a uh, sort of a, a way to, to put your content on steroids. Uh, we, we also did um, uh, the, the uh, introdu introduction of the expertise score, which I talked to you about uh, a little bit briefly before. And this is a way to the, sort of the E and the EAT algorithm where we're able to, to uh, understand what the expertise level of, of the content was. There were, previous algorithms in our model that did sort of like a, 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 a first generation way of, of understanding the, the content writing level skill, you know, sort of a grade skill. Uh, and I think uh, that we didn't the Hemingway find... app had, had something similar as you're writing. It told you what level, yeah. like you're writing right. for somebody with, with a master's degree, you're writing for and our somebody. Mo yeah. In our, in our models, it was very weak, cor weakly correlated in our models. And, um, and now that we've introduced the expertise score, uh, one of the first things that we, we're, we're noticing right away is how well it was correlated. I mean, it was instantly highly correlated without any fine tuning of our team. Uh, so we knew right away off the bat, there's, this is a pretty strong signal in, in 2022. So, I wish, so that was I done. Wish users understood that more, Scott. I feel like, I feel like, um, I feel like business owners, when it comes to keywords and content, they, they say, I need to rank for this keyword. They go to, you know, a, a college student or intern or freelancer and like, Hey, write me some content. And the person who's writing the content is just like, there's no research in, involved. There's just like, I'm going to write some fluff and put a call to action on here. But that's not, that's not how you write for search. You write based on, you know, what, you know, your users are looking for. You study right. the, the search results to see what they're, 
uh, what other sites are saying, but ultimately use tools like Market Brew to to really give you a guideline of, of how to write, what level to write at, what topics you know the audience needs to see, um, and and what tone you need to take with that person. Is this transactional? Is it informational? Is it navigational? Right. And I, I think I think a lot of, of most unfortunately most writers don't um, don't take all those different elements into consideration when they're writing content. And like my content's amazing and it's a thousand words and it's got all these pictures, right? But but it's not what users want for the query that you're trying to rank for. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad Market Brew exists to help you know uh, you know webmasters and writers through that. And I mean to fair to be fair, we're not the only ones that have amazing content uh, software, right? There's lots of co- companies out there that have you know great content writing uh, capabilities. I think that the the main disambiguation between uh, Market Brew and those are uh, the context, right? So be, we have a model that you're doing it in the context of. So if you're trying to rank for a specific target page for a specific keyword, you as you're writing this content, you can see the other pages in the model and how they're performing. Which ones are the outperformers? It's not always the number one site, right? It could be the number five site is the the outperformer. But it, and it gets all the, the model traffic. number five. And so could be that's the away. site that you want to emulate, right? So mm-hmm. it'll actually give you the right target. And then as you're working towards the goal, it actually will show you this, that statistical gap closing. So you know what the end goal is, right? You don't, you don't spend like 10 times more money and revenue trying to solve this problem than you could, than you needed to. You can or use go on five to other... different tools to try to do one thing. Yeah. 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 It's a sort of all in a sort of an all, all together. We also are introducing a link flow finder. So this uh, is a extension to our link flow distribution uh, graph. So uh, part of the internal structure of the of, of a site, you know, that internal link graph, yep. we can uh, we score every individual link like a regular search engine does, like a modern search engine. This is actually far more complex than you than you might imagine as a non-engineer. Uh, this is something that where every single link has uh, many different algorithms that then depend on you know, the, for instance, like the relevancy of an anchor text and a link, right? To get the relevancy, you have to also score the the spotlight focus and the the market focus of that target page to understand what is the relevancy of that target of that anchor text to the content of the page. And is, um, is and that, in a block module or in the body context? And correct. Is it editorial? Is is it reciprocal? Is it site wide reciprocal? There's all these things that where where you're not just exploring one level of algorithm off that link, but you then you're it's like literally you have to stop it at some point, right? Because you could continuously recursively calculate this uh, if you wanted to. And so the scoring of links uh, is highly complex and it's also very uh, high compute, right? So that's a, a sort of a big secret sauce that we have uh, in Market Brew that we've sort of uh, efficiently optimized over the years where we can take large scale sites and, and efficiently score every single individual link that we need to uh, and, and input that into these, uh, these link graphs. So we get these really, really nice link graphs they're very accurate. We know exactly how much uh, a search engine attributes to a, a, any individual page based off of all types of things. It doesn't matter whether you canonicalize things or you, you know, uh, 301 redirected or uh, meta robots whatever. blocked or whatever. It, it, it takes all this stuff into consideration. And then uh, then the, the goal really, the, the challenge is then uh, how do we move that graph, right? So if we got our homepages at number seven, right? If it, it's getting the seventh amount of, of, of uh, link flow distribution uh, in the site, uh, how do we move that to closer to number one? And so, you know, it's always been a kind of a struggle manually trying to convince people or, or explain to people uh, what, what are the different options to do that. And then obviously there's political considerations in each company of can we even do something like that? So we created this thing called the link flow finder. And what this does is it actually uses our internal Lucene query parser inside of, inside of market brew models okay. to search for all the places in the co- in the content in the site uh n- knowing all the link flow distribution information from all those pages as well mm-hmm. to output sort of what are the best places to go and harvest these internal links right. um so, so you mentioned you know, a keyword then you uh, but you're not using that keyword to link to the respective page or worse you're you're emphasizing a keyword on a page and it's cannibalizing the page that Correct. you're trying to rank. So by linking yeah, so, that to the right So it's page. a sort of an automated way to, to, to push wow. this forward uh, where you can kind of just find where all that link flow is that you need. And then obviously in the future, uh, in, in the end of 2022, we're, we're looking at a thing called the, the uh, I'm going to get this right, the Market Brew link script. 
Okay. So we're looking at link script, which is basically a uh, just a tag that you'll add onto the page. This is not new. Some other companies do this, but we're doing this in the context of an actual search engine model uh, where it will actually detect uh, and do the link flow finding for you and, and sort of insert that uh, those links uh, as necessary to, to essentially uh, anneal the link flow distribution so that it's the way it's supposed to be. So, that's so that's awesome. a, a really cool thing. Um, we have a schema generator that we've entered uh, into the system. So part of the spotlight focus, it gives us the ability to extract all those entities out. And now with a sort of a click of a button, you can just copy uh, a, a, a schema that you can paste on each page and that taps. So this this sort of has lots of video Google. thumbnails. So we'll use the video object schema on this page since we have a video uh, yeah. as opposed to the uh, FAQ page markup since some of the results seem to have an FAQ snippet under them. So you're, you're using the right snippet for the page based on the SERP. I love that. Kind yeah, of and it, it allows you to obviously you can customize and stuff, but it's it's ready to go out of the box. You just copy it. It's it's extracted all the entities out, uh -huh. and then obviously we're going to have some, some version two point products where you can you know uh, uh, customize that so that it doesn't include certain entities that you you don't want and stuff like that. That is um, sick. I can't wait to see two point I know I saw a little bit of a preview of it a couple months ago, and I was like, when are they rolling it out? <laughs> so I'm, I'm stoked to see the new uh, UI. And then, we'll, uh, we'll have to do like a demo together of it and record it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, night, for sure. Yeah, we're I'm really proud of it. I mean, it looks it looks beautiful. It's like a a, a new Ferrari or Porsche <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, a new Tesla. Um, uh, so so and then finally, we're putting in a task uh, based system that's coming out with this UI refresh. So it'll go in on Saturday, and it's basically a uh, we talked about this, and in fact, you were actually one of the impetus to to putting this in or prioritizing the, the release of this. Um, and that is, uh, we, we take in each analysis group, we kind of uh, understand what the, the priority of action items are compared to, you know, based off of this, the statistical gaps. And uh, we, we introduced a ton more boost factors or algorithms into the model now. Boost factors are essentially algorithms that can be uh, 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 fungible, right? So we can change the bias and weight settings on these things. They're not just fixed in the model. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've we've added about three times the amount of algorithms that we had before. Uh, so there's a whole wave of new algorithms uh, that are coming into the model. Uh, so with that uh, uh, paired with this new task system, we're, we're just getting these really fine-tuned, uh, actionable recommendations that come out of the system now. Uh, that are just focused in on your target page and your context of for your specific search result page uh, uh, listing in that environment. Um, so all of that is uh, going to be uh, paired with uh, what we call uh, uh, market brew teams. And so market brew teams essentially is what you kind of think of what a team is. It's sort of like uh, the work workspace management workflow. type of a thing, yeah. uh, workflow, and you can assign uh, these tasks to certain uh, uh, groups and members. CRM. The tasks I themselves are broken down into yeah. like the types of tasks. So you can uh, essentially assign certain types uh, and these can, this can just happen automatically. If you set up your, your team, you know, That's you right. can have an on-page team and they will only see a, a feed, a flow of all the on-page tasks uh, and, you know, sorted by uh, this uh, optimization score essentially. So that that basically is a, a new thing that's coming. Well, out. Let's, so let's schedule a, a, a like a like a demo session, then we'll we'll do some editing on it. So that way we have something sure. that that we can share because there's there's a lot of things you're going to explain that some people might think is a little bit over their heads. And um, and during the call, what we'll do is I'll I'll help kind of bring it down a level for those people that are you know good at at search but don't necessarily understand algorithms the way that you do now you've got yeah, a website that, that people can ask you questions at right that's like uh ask the search ask engineer. the search engineer com. yeah so uh, ask dot the search engineer com. uh it's just a I, I we just i just started i threw it up there it's just a kind of a personal site where i just said you know hey uh if you want to ask a question uh, I haven't really spent too much time on it because oh, you're going to be pushing so hard on market I, I hope you have 26 hours in a day because just, I'm going to be loading <laughs> that thing up, man. We, I did. So I talked at uh, 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 the Advanced uh, Search Summit in Napa uh, uh -huh. last year. And um, I was the one I, in the front row who was on his knees doing this thing, you know, like <laughs> bowing and I'm not worthy. And so you know, the, the, the <laughs> story behind that is, well, I mean, like the, the day before I, I sent out a, a tweet saying, you know, uh, I'm going to do a, I'm going to basically do a Q and a session. I, I decided I wanted to just do a Q and a cause I had so many questions. I figured let's just turn most of this into a Q and a, I'll do a quick thing on market brew and we'll, we'll just answer questions from a search engineer's perspective. And that was so highly popular that I kind of, you know, 
that really kind of uh, uh, was the impetus to, to starting this uh, the site. But uh, I, I ended up with like 30 or 40 different questions just from like one person uh, one person alone, uh, filled out the entire timeline. So we, oh we basically just spent the whole, uh, uh, session answering questions. And it's, it's, it's surprising, you know, with the lack of transparency and the opacity of, of, of Google's black box or Google's PR team or whatever, um, the, the, the desire to, to, to talk to an actual search engineer and get an actual search engineer to just respond from an engineer's perspective, not an SEO perspective or a marketing perspective, just, you know, as a software engineer that designs search engines, what, you know, what, you know, what is the perspective on a lot of these uh, questions? So um, that's sort of what I, I enjoy doing it because it's just a passion. We have been doing it for so long that it's There's fairly a easy. Lot of I mean, it's frustrated just frustrated SEOs out there. So you're, you're helping to relieve uncertainty. Sure. You're helping to give up a, a voice to something where, where a lot of folks feel lost, especially those, you know, whose, whose skill sets lie in, in content you know, yeah. and in um, in the off page side of, of outreach and link earning, you know that the the tech geeks, you know, I'm sure they they eat the stuff up, but the content and and outreach folks, you know, this is all new territory for them. The fact yeah. that you're you're giving them a voice where you know Google's giving them a lot of vagueness in many cases, I think it's a great great thing that you're you're doing that, and I'm I'm definitely gonna load that sucker up. So. Yeah, and I'm, the the end goal for Market Brew really is, uh, you know, we've been mostly in the enterprise space for you know the last five years, and we're we're trying to move towards uh, the agency and the sort of the small business space where we can distill all of this complexity down. And it's a hard ta- it's a hard challenge, right? It's not something that's just we can just do it. Um, we can make a simple platform, but it's not going to really be that powerful, and it's not going to really do. You know, people have built plenty of simple. Uh, platforms for for entry level or and intermediate uh, SEOs, yeah. but we're trying to take something that's very very complex, an actual search engine, mm-hmm. and boil it down into actionable tasks. Uh, we're we're, tr- we're going to be introducing uh, you know how to videos on each screen. Now that we have this beautiful interface, uh, we, we we'll try to uh, have this workflow that anybody can can uh, use, whether you're just starting out. Or you're an expert uh, in house SEO to large, you know, large e-commerce brand. So Sounds that's sort of the goal. It's it's good. It's it's a never-ending goal. Just like a search engineer at, at Google, it's a never-ending goal to close up all of their their loopholes and, and continuously try to improve their. Uh, like you said, you found so many different uh, content hacks right now mm-hmm. that are screwing up their search results. So just like they're staying up at night, late at night, I'm constantly uh, up at night thinking about like, oh, you know. We could introduce this this signal because you know this this could help our uh, this group of people very easily to understand you know how the search engine is behaving in that that part of the world or that part of the SERP. So yep. um, we're just going to continuously do what we do best, which is just build search engines, um, and hopefully that'll have uh, uh, good utility in the industry. Um, already help, already uh, has. Can't wait to see 2.0. And Scott, thank you so much, by the way, for hanging out with us and it's really nerding out on on search and search algorithms. I Guys, love it. Yeah, I'll do the same time. Ask the, uh, ask the search engineer. Is that what it is? Ask.thesearchengineer.com. You and uh, and then it's markerbrew.ai for the uh, site. We'll have a, a new site up uh, probably in a few weeks. Okay. And uh, the soft release of the the new interface, so all of our existing clients Perfect. will see that on uh, Saturday. And we'll get all the links in there. Scott, thank you again for your time today and for being on the show. And we're definitely going to do this again. I can't wait to do that demo with you. That was a pleasure, Steve. Thanks, everybody.